Now, as we first reported with Rohit last night, little by little, Syria's President Assad has been trying to rehabilitate himself in the eyes of the world, even though he is still waging war against his own people. The thought that he'll return to the global stage at a climate conference in three months' time is for many unthinkable and unbearable to those British and American who have suffered at his hands and survived and the families of those who have not. Honestly, the best part of my day are the few seconds it takes me to recall where I am and what has happened. This is where Kevin Dawes lives. Waking, uh, not waking from a nightmare, but waking into one. His car, barely roadworthy, hardly homeworthy. It was no different in the prison. Something I guess I've grown accustomed to. That prison was in Damascus, where he was held and tortured for three years. I was hooded and blindfolded and taken to uh, Branch 248, the military branch, one of the uh, darkest holes in the face of the earth. Beaten and starved, he thought he wouldn't survive. I was certain I was near the end, I was going to die soon, and I, I, I didn't fear it at that point. And I always wondered when I would find out, when I would finally when I would finally end up in the trash with the rest of them. He's referring there to the bin bags used to cover the bodies taken to the secret mass graves, which News at 10 identified last night. But this is only half of the story of a friendship formed in prison with a man he never met, but shared whispers with through the cell war. Abbas Khan had traveled to Syria to help victims of the war. We, uh began shouting at each other under the door. I forget who spoke first. I think he may have heard me addressing a guard when I was placed in my cell and we started talking. Uh, Abbas and I made a pact. Whichever of us made it to the West first had to return news of the other. We're in Essex to trace his route to that prison. Abbas had two kids of his own, two young kids, they were five and six years old, and he was seeing children of that same age being bombed, being hurt, being killed, suffering. His sister was told he was dead after he spent more than a year in jail. The two paths of the two men diverged when Kevin was released. The very first thing I said when I arrived in Germany at a launch to army base on the campus of Ramstein Air Force Base was, there is a UK citizen there by the name of Abbas Khan. And I was cut off by uh, an FBI agent who said that Abbas Khan was dead. We are very relieved for Kevin and his family that he was managed to um, have a successful release and Abbas unfortunately didn't have the same fate. Survival became a lottery. Abbas's mother saw his decline on a visit to his prison in Syria. He was unrecognizable when my mother found him. Uh, he was uh, like a walking skeleton almost. He weighed 20 kilos. After he was killed, she confronted regime officials. Please tell me why you killed my son, please. For God's sake, tell me why you killed my son. How does it feel to you a decade on for there to be no, no justice, no sense of justice? The fact that there's been no interest at all um, from the British government to get in touch with us or to even inform us. There's been no interest to hold Syria accountable. The Foreign Office says it consistently sought access to Abbas while in detention and continues to work to expose the Assad regime. And inside Syria, a wave of protests grew further today as some of Assad's old enemies prepare to welcome him back in from the cold. I hope the reason that why, why people aren't complaining, why people aren't trying to stop it is because they don't know and not because they don't care. A haunting fear that the unforgettable might soon be forgivable. Rohit Katru, News at 10.